Okay, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning. Hope you all had a good weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, all of you rested well in the weekend. Yes, okay. Okay, let's uh, begin our uh, study. Welcome all our um, online students and also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Thank you all for joining class. Um, we'll begin. Uh, can somebody lead us in prayer, please? Somebody can take the mic and lead us in prayer. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this another day. As we are going to study, we ask your leading and guidance with us. Open our heart and minds so that whatever we are going to listen, we're going to learn, oh Lord, it will like seed so into our heart and we'll be able to bring fruits. Oh Lord Jesus, I'm giving each and every one into your hand. In Jesus' name I pray, oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Are you able to hear Nelson, online students? Yes, no, okay. Okay, so we are looking at the introduction to the fivefold ministry. Um, and we looked at um, how Jesus Christ, or God, calls some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. And we also saw that minist the ministry gift or the fivefold ministry office is a divine call. It's not something that, uh, you know, we desire, we choose. Uh, we want or uh, we like to have, but it's something that is uh, a divine call. God calls us into these fivefold ministries. Okay. And we also saw that the ministry gift is resident inside each one of us. Okay. We might not know what are our gifts and our callings and our functions, but we know that the ministry gift is there put inside us by God. It's resident inside us. Resident means what? Huh? It's dwelling, yes. It's it's there inside us. Okay. Um, we also looked at uh, how the fivefold ministry uh, during the dark ages was not functioning in the church. But then last class we saw how God, uh, you know, reinstituted these fivefold ministries in the church. Right? Yes or no? Yes, how he restored the fivefold ministries in the church. And then we were looking at why did God give these fivefold ministries? Okay? Why did God give these fivefold ministries? Can you please take the mic? Can speak? Yes. For equipping the saints. Okay, for equipping the saints. What else? Edifying the body of Christ. Yes, edifying the body of Christ. Thank you. Preparing God's people for works of service and for building up of the body of Christ. Okay. So if you look at your notes, the purpose of the fivefold ministry uh, is given for the perfecting or the complete equipping of the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry resulting in the building in the body of Christ. Yes. Thank you, Lucy. Yes, it's to edify and to equip. Okay. So the fivefold ministry offices exist to equip the saints so that the saints can do the ministry. Okay. Who are the saints? Yes, the believers. The, the, uh, the saints are people who are part of the church. Okay. Those who are believers. Okay, so we see that uh, the fivefold ministry offices were given or exist to serve, to equip, to impart, to train, and to release the saints for the work of the ministry. Yes. Question: Like uh, these for uh, since these are all like uh, the fivefold ministry, it's all given to us. Uh, my question By is Jesus, like yeah. yes. So the question is like, is it like before our birth that God knows and uh, this is what I would want he and she, he or she to be uh, used in the kingdom, or is it like as we walk in the journey of life and then 
God, I know God knows everything from the In past from the to the years. Okay. But still, is it like something that we are uh, blessed with before we are born, or is it something that we go through the journey of life? And what then... do you all think? What do the others think? You you heard his question, right? His question is: Did God plan our call, our function, our role, or whether we should be part of the ministry, fivefold ministry office before we were born? Or after we were born and in the process. Sister, can I answer? Yes, sure. Get rude. Yeah, this is before the foundation of the world. God has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Yes. Yes, five four ministry offices also in the calling also everything God purposed and planned even before the foundations of the world. So even before the He created everything, He had everything in His mind. Everything was done, um, uh, accomplished, a done thing in the heart and mind of God even before He started. So everything that He has planned for your life from the beginning to the end, He knows everything. He knows the calling He has for you, the plans and the purposes. And whether you're called into the fivefold offices, he knows that. Okay, so yes, as Lucy also says, he before and he chose us before, uh, even before he created us, even before we are formed in our mother's womb, even before we were born on this earth. Okay, so the fivefold ministry offices they exist or to equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry. Okay, now. Um, if you look at um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it, uh, and uh, it says, He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, so that the body of Christ may be built up, okay, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, now this word equip has the uh, idea of to put right, okay. Basically, the word equip means it has an idea of to put right, okay? Or it has the idea of making someone adequate or sufficient for something, okay? Making someone adequate or making someone sufficient for something or for some purpose, okay? The ancient Greek word for this word equip or equipping basically describes setting broken bones okay setting up of broken bones or mending nets okay so it's basically what it's trying to uh, or the classical greek also describes it as something that is you know restoring dislocated limbs or setting broken bones in place it's also used for uh, furnishing a guest room to get uh, it ready for guests so what are you basically do you're preparing Okay, preparing a guest room for your guests to come. You're pre preparing for the arrival of the guests. Or it's also restoring a dislocated limb, okay, or a broken bone. It's putting it into its place or mending a net. So that is what it means to equip, okay. It is to basically strengthen, to build up, um, to mend, to make someone fit for something. Okay, so in this context, it is making someone fit for the ministry, for the work of the Lord. Okay, so all of these ministries, these fivefold offices, is to produce strong individuals or believers or saints in the church who can do the real work of the ministry. Okay, so those who are in the fivefold office, it's not all about. Us. Sometimes we begin, sometimes we get come to this place and we think, oh, the church is functioning because of the fivefold of ministries. Okay. Or only those in the fivefold ministries are very, very important. All of us as believers or saints who go to the church, who just attend church, or maybe just attending Bible college, we're just doing it to gain knowledge for fellowship, to grow more in the Lord. Yes, all those things are important. But actually, the fivefold ministry office is for those people called into the fivefold ministry office. It's not for them to do everything. Sometimes they think that, you know, it's all about us, right? It's not about the people in the fivefold office, but it's all about people. It's all about 
saints. It's all about the believers in the church. And it's not about us in the fivefold ministry serving and those who are believers or those who in the church, they have to follow us or do whatever we say or, you know, they serve under us uh, so that they know we are leaders. No, it is for us as those in the fivefold ministry to equip the believers and it is a believer's responsibility to go out and do the ministry. Okay. So it's not the fivefold people, people in the fivefold ministry to go and do all the ministry and everything. But it's also, it's the saints who are to go and do the ministry. Amen. So whether you are a housewife or um, a businessman or, um, you know, like uh, uh, we see in the, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts, in the early church, Stephen was somebody who was just then, somebody was waiting on the tables, like administrator. Philip was somebody who was waiting on people, just serving food, you know. And um, we know Phoebe was um, a, a, a cloth merchant. And who was Paul? Uh, he was a persecutor, yes, but what was his business? He was a businessman, right? Tent he was maker. a tent, yes, tent maker, a tent making business. But we see yet God called them into those fivefold ministry office. And we see that in the early church, even though these people were, you know, just uh, waiting on people on, uh, 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 on tables for them or, you know, just serving food or doing administrative work, whatever, we see that they had gifts and they functioned in the body of Christ, right? So don't think that, you know, uh, it's not for the believers or the church members to do the ministry. It's only those who are called to specific roles know it's all of us who are the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people called by God to declare his praises and to bring people from darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Okay. So those who in the fivefold ministry, it's not like, hey, you know, we are like um, Superman, Superwoman, you know, we are leadership position. It's no, it is, we are to perfect the saints, perfect them, equip them, strengthen them, build them to do the work of the ministry. And that results in building up of the body of the of Christ, building up of the church. Okay. So what is the goal? Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What is the goal? 1 Corinthians Sorry, not First Corinthians, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. We'll come to First Corinthians later. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. What is the goal? The purpose, what is the purpose we saw of these fivefold ministry offices in um, verse 12? What is the goal of it? What is the goal of us in the fivefold ministry office to equip, build, strengthen, unity, and mature? Sorry? Unity in the what church. What is the goal? Unity in the church. Okay. Look at verse 13. What does it say? Somebody can read verse 13, please. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Yes. So what is the goal? Okay. Unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. What else? To become a to mature man. Okay. Secondly. And the third one? And come to the measure of the stature which is you know, full measure of Jesus Christ. Okay, so till we come, till we all come to the unity of the faith, we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, we all come to a perfect, mature man, the full measure of Christ's stature. Okay, now it says, um, uh, in some versions, it says to attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. Now this word attain, uh, is used nine times in the book of Acts and it basically refers to travelers arriving at their destination. Okay, so each of these phrases attain 
uh, uh, the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God or attain to a mature man or attain to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's basically saying what each of these phases, phrases involves a process that results in a goal. Yes or no? All of these being mature, you know, um, being built up in the in the faith, being equipped, being strengthened, all of them has a specific goal that we are looking for. Okay, so can we all attain this goal? Can we all attain this goal? This, uh, this goal, can we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, come to perfect man? It's a journey, okay? It's something that we will not perfectly attain till Christ comes again, yes or no? Okay, it's not something that we can attain in till we see Christ, until he returns. But it's something that we should aim towards. Not because you say, hey, this is not uh, achievable or attainable, fully attainable. Yes, we can attain it to a certain limit. But it's fully realized, okay, and perfectly attained when Christ returns. Okay. So, yes, Daniel says no. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, so here we see that, you know, uh, the first one is unity of the faith. Okay, so if you look at the same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, uh, Paul also speaks about unity over there. What does it, what is the unity speaking about there? Can somebody read verse 3 of chapter 4, Ephesians 4? Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Yeah, so he's saying here, keep, uh, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Okay, so... Paul is saying there is unity of the spirit that already exists amongst us, okay, as believers. And how does it exist among us, amongst us as believers? By the virtue of our new faith or our new life in Christ Jesus or our new birth, okay? So when we are born again, we are basically united with God. We are united with the Holy Spirit. So that unity already exists exists okay if you look at uh, first corinthians 12 verse 13 paul says there that we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether jews or gentiles slave or free we are all given the one spirit to drink so he's saying that everyone who is born again a born again saint is baptized into the body of christ by the holy spirit and that happens the moment we are you know we receive or accept jesus christ as our lord and savior so but what is paul meaning to say here when he says we all come to the unity of the faith when he's already spoken about the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace what does he mean when he says here unity of the faith okay um sorry there is no division okay so he's saying that this goal is to be attained. Unity of the Spirit is already attained when we are born again. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We are part of the Holy Spirit. We are part of the body of Christ. Okay, we are all baptized by one Spirit. And uh, we, are, we have unity in the Spirit. But here Paul is referring, when he's referring to the unity of the faith, it's not something that is already existent. Okay, but it's a goal that we need to attain. Okay, so he's saying, come to the unity of the faith. So here, faith is referring to essential truths of the Christian doctrine. Okay, that is that the gospel is centered on. So basically, he's saying that you know you need to come to the unity of the faith of these essential truths. Uh, that is, uh, you know, the basis for our Christian faith, uh, which is centered on the gospel. So Paul is basically here in verse um, uh, verse 13, referring to doctrinal unity, not unity of the spirit or being baptized into the spirit. He's here talking about doctrinal unity that comes through the teaching of the word. So the more you understand the word, the closer will be your experience in your unity with others, right? So even as we are 
teaching and preaching in our church, people come because they come to APC because they're united in the doctrines. If they disagree on the doctrines, they will find some church that, you know, uh, uh, that agrees to the doctrines they believe. So Paul is basically here referring to doctrine and unity that comes about through the teaching of the word. So the more you understand God's word, the closer will be your experience of unity with others who also believe in the same doctrines, who also know the word of God well. Okay, So the heart of that unity is a common knowledge of the love for Jesus Christ. Okay, So he, all of these doctrinal beliefs is uh, what is the common or the centerpiece is the love for Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay. And here we also see that Paul is linking the unity of the faith with the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, uh, Paul very rarely uses this phrase or this term, Son of God. We see he uses only in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, Galatians chapter 2, verse uh, 2, and the first Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Basically, there he's emphasizing the deity of Jesus Christ. He's saying that Jesus Christ is God who was sent by the Father to the earth to, you know, secure our salvation. Okay. So, but we see how he links the unity of the faith to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay. So here he's saying that the unity of the faith should be on the doctrines. And the heart of that unity is the knowledge of our love for Jesus Christ. Are you all able to understand? Yes. Okay. Now, the word knowledge here has a nuance of real or true knowledge, okay? So it's not just talking about an academic ability to understand the various doctrines of Jesus Christ or the various doctrines that are in the Bible, although that is very, very important. Rather, here it's talking about the Son of God and knowing the Son of God in a very intimate and personal way. So not just knowing the doctrines for the sake of intellectual knowledge or wisdom or just like an academic uh, study or uh, you know uh, ability to know the various doctrines but is here is talking about knowing the doctrines so that we can be so intimate in our relationship in our walk in our love with god so what really binds us in unity what is a important ingredient for unity love yes you know only when i love somebody I'll just be united with them. If I don't love somebody, what happens? I'm constantly bickering or complaining or grumbling or just have some fault that I can find with them. So here it's talking about unity of the uh, faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. It's basically talking about the knowing God in such an intimate, personal way that is bringing us to loving Him more closer in a more personal way. So as we know Christ more deeply, you know, each one of us, we will experience closer unity in Christ. That is what Paul is pointing here. Okay. The second goal he's saying is that the body will grow to a mature man. Okay. Maturity. So what is the, the end result of maturity? Yes, to become like Jesus Christ. To become to the full stature of Jesus Christ. To be more Christ-like. Okay, so the goal is that the body of Christ will grow to be a mature man, which means maturity in all areas, maturity in your walk with God, maturity in obedience to all of the areas in your life, maturity in your relationships with people, and maturity in our gifts and in our calling. Okay, so it says here that the, the, uh, the goal is so that the body will grow to the measure of the stature which belongs to fullness of Christ. Here, stature may sometimes refer to physical stature or stature can also uh, be a reference to age. But here, it's speaking about figuratively of maturity. Okay, It's not talking about a position or it's not talking about age, stature. But the stature he's talking here is about maturity. Okay, the measure of spiritual maturity is when you come to, you know, the fullness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself is the fullness of God. Yes or no? 
right? We read that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Can somebody read that, please? Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians 1 19 for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him so God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in whom in Jesus Christ yes so Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 can somebody else read that please for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily yes for in in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily Form. So when we're saying to come to the full, uh, perfect, mature man or the full measure of Jesus, stature of Jesus Christ, we're saying that we come to a place where we are, you know, manifesting or exhibiting or reflecting or radiating who Christ is in all of his fullness, in all of his glory. Amen. Okay. So look at how great and uh, precious God's thoughts are towards us. He, he just does not want us to live on this earth to do or fulfill or expand his kingdom. But his main goal is that we all come to the fullness of the Son of God, that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? <coughs> yes. So we are to radiate and reflect Christ's perfections. So our goal as a church or a body of Christ or believers is to come to that complete Christ-likeness, right? Where the world looks at us and knows and has a taste or a glimpse of who the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ is. So we are here to represent him and represent him. Any doubts so far? Okay, some people say, like it's given in your notes, that there are only four fold, uh, uh, four of uh, ministry offices that God calls us to, because they say that the pastor and the teacher is one and the same. But we will maintain is uh, maintain it as a fivefold ministry office, because some of them can be teachers, not necessarily pastors or apostles or prophets. Okay. Now, uh, is the fivefold ministry also mentioned elsewhere in the Bible? Where? It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 to 31. Okay. Before we look at that, I just want to mention something here. When Paul says that, you know, we all come to the full knowledge of the Son of God. You know, um, we know that, you know, Paul, even though he had numerous revelations, even though he started so many churches, he was a he was an apostle, an evangelist. He had written so many epistles, so many books. He had a first-hand encounter with God. But yet, what was Paul longing and thirsting for always? Or what was he desiring for the saints? What was he desiring for himself? Even though Paul had received numerous revelations, he started many churches, Right? He had written so many books, he had first-hand encounters with God. But what was his deep longing and thirst always? And what was he also longing and desiring for the believers? That they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Right? Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Can somebody read that, please? Philippians, can you pass the mic so that somebody can else can read? Philippians 3.10 That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being confirmed to his death. Yes. So Paul here is long, conveying his longing not just to know about Christ, but to have a deep experiential knowledge of who this Jesus Christ is. And that's why he's saying here, you know, um, and he's also including in his thirst, his experiential knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, he's saying that I want to understand the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, okay? Sharing with his sufferings and ultimately being shaped by his 
death. Okay, so here we see Paul's desire for and thirst for knowing more of the deeper things of Jesus Christ. And he also writes, when he writes to various churches, he says, my desire is that you would, you know, grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay, so just like Paul, it should also become our desire that each one of us, that we grow in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to grow into perfect man, the full measure of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now looking at um, uh, where else in the Bible do we read this fivefold ministry offices? So people have pointed out also to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 28 to 31. So can somebody else read that please? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 28 to 31. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the Is that head. First Corinthians 12, 38, 28 to 31. 28, okay. 28. To and 30. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, uh, then gifts of healings, helps administrations, uh, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, uh, but honestly desire the best gifts. And yet I saw you are you are more excellent way. Yes. So here is also mentioned the fivefold offices, okay, in First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. So First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11, Paul, what does he talk about there in First Corinthians 12, 7 to 11? The gifts of the Spirit. Okay, the gifts of the Spirit. And are the gifts of the Spirit available to all believers? Yes, okay. And then uh, there's gifts of the Spirit. And then there is also, we saw in Ephesians chapter 4, the fivefold ministry offices or gifts. We also spoke about, remember the last class, about membership gifts. Yes or no? Where do we find the membership gifts? Where do we find the gifts of the Spirit? Huh? Hebrews? Where do we find the gifts of the Spirit? I just now told you. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. Okay, gifts of the Spirit. Where do we find our membership gifts? Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. So you can remember 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is gifts of the Spirit. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8 is the membership gifts. Can somebody read the membership gifts, please? First, Romans 12, 6 to 8. Do all the believers have the gifts of the Spirit? Nine gifts of the Spirit when you're baptized, yes. Do all the uh, believers have the membership gifts? All the membership gifts? Not all. You have one or more of the membership gifts. Okay? Yes. Romans? No, you have to read it. The, my. Give it to him, give it to him quickly. Or an online student, anyone can read or any, okay, read. Having then gifts differing, uh, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them if prof uh, prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, uh, he who uh, leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Yes, so here it's talking about the membership gifts. Okay, serving, encouraging, teaching, prophesying, you know, uh, giving generously, leading, showing mercy, all of these. Okay, so all of us as believers have one or more of these membership gifts. And these membership gifts are also called as grace gifts okay but your membership gifts that is given to you is not just given randomly but is 
given depending on your calling or the function in the body of Christ. Okay. So can all those in the fivefold office have membership gifts? Yes, because you need to be encourager, you know, teaching, prophesying, serving, administrating, etc. Uh, can all of those in the fivefold ministry office also have um, the gifts of the spirit? Yes. Can those in the membership, those who have membership gifts, can they have the fivefold? Uh, can, can they have the gifts of the spirit? Yes. Can they also be called into the fivefold office? Yes. Okay. So. Um, yeah, thank you, online students. So here we see the gifts of the spirit, the membership gifts, and we also see the fivefold ministry offices or gifts that is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Okay, so you have clarity on that, right? Now, so here it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and God has appointed these in the church. Okay, God has appointed means what? God has put in place for his own use so god has appointed means god has put these things in place all of these things in place for his own use in the church now uh, it says that you know god has appointed these in the church what is the meaning of these or in the kjv version it says some basically implying specific people not everyone okay specific people not everyone so for some he has given you know he is some he is called to be apostles prophets uh teachers some miracle workers the gifts of healing helps administration so some okay so the word these is basically talking about that it's implying specific people not everyone and here it says he gave these for in the church first apostles second prophets, third teachers, and after that mir miracles, and then uh, gifts of healing, helps, and administrations. Now, what does the word first mean here? The Greek word used here is proton, okay? It means first in time, or first in place, or it also means first in rank, influence, honor. Okay, so any one of these things it can mean. It can mean first in time, first in place, or first in the rank, influence, or honor. Okay? So God has put some people in these roles or functions, or he's put some of them in these places, giving their place of rank, influence, and honor. That is what it means. Okay. Now what does the word helps mean? Helps here basically is render, rendering to any kind of help that people give by giving aid or assistance or service or help. Okay. Can also be called as helpers. Who are the administrators? The KJV, it says governments, basically those who govern, rule, and, you know, basically are leading things. Okay. So here we see that Paul, Apostle Paul, is listing out an assortment of ministry gifts, okay? And it's basically also membership gifts. But here they say that, you know, the gifts of healing and miracles is attributed to evangelists. So here we see that, you know, he mentions apostles, prophets, teachers, but what else is ministering from, uh, missing from the fivefold ministry office here? Look at your Bibles. What else is missing from the, of the fivefold ministry Evangelist. office here? Evangelists, Evangelist. yes, and and pastors, yes, evangelists and pastors. Thank you, Gertrude. So here, evangelists and pastors are missing. So here, basically, the gifts of healing and miracles are the work of evangelists, right? How do we know it's the work of evangelists? Why are we saying that gifts of healing and miracles uh, can be attributed to evangelists? Yes, we can see in the book of Acts, right? Uh, Philip was an evangelist. He went down to Samaria and he did some mighty signs, miracles, and 
wonders. Stephen was also an evangelist, also did mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. And we see so many other evangelists as uh, well. Okay. And pastors, the word pastors is not given here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we see helps and administrations. So they say help and administration is the role of the pastor, right? Because the 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 picture of a pastor in the Old and New Testament is that of a shepherd. Okay. So shepherd who helps his sheep and also, you know, a pastor should be a good administrator. Yes or no? Okay. So here we see all of the fivefold ministry offices also mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. Okay. And um, the order that is stated, first is whom? Apostles. Second is prophets. Third is teachers. Then is evangelists. Okay. Because we have gifts of healing and miracles. And the last is pastors because it's talking about helps and administration. Okay. Now, when we look at uh, this uh, division, you know, it's, it should be understood in two ways. Okay. Should be understood as something that was the way it unfolded in the early church. Now, in the early church, who are the first ones to do the ministry, to take the gospel? Disciples or what else were they called? Apostles, right? The 11 apostles, you know, who uh, began the church, who, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, found, they, they found their role was as apostles were foundational to the church. They're the ones who were sent out, they established church, they laid the groundwork for the faith, uh, they provided a leadership in the church, and also their role was one of authority and governance yes or no yes okay so it basically involved church planting teaching of the doctrines doctrinal instructions and oversight okay so we see that in the early church the apostles were first appointed by jesus christ who were responsible for spreading the gospel and establishing the first community of believers or the church yes can you give him the mic he has a question please When they actually casted lots to uh, choose a disciple in place of Judas Iscariot, Matthias. Matthias yeah. So we don't hear anything about him or uh, thing apart from that he was just selected or replaced, no? Yeah, we don't read yeah. anything about Matthias in the Bible. Yes, yes. That he was replaced and that's his name. Yes, yes. Maybe he's done some ministry, but we don't know. Or he's not done anything. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. And also we see that, you know, after the apostles came the prophets, okay? Uh, because that is how we see this written here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. That was the order in which we see that in the early church. So we also see that the, uh, the prophets came up, they spoke, uh, they were just providing guidance to the early church, they were providing insights in the word of God, the will of God for the church, and also they were correcting the church okay so we see that yes prophets were there in the old testament as well but here we see in the early church this was the order apostles came then uh, prophets the prophets were basically you know uh, the, the apostles laid the foundation the prophets were crucial in guiding and directing the early church and often they helped in uh, shaping its direction and ensuring that the church was aligned with God's plan and God's purposes. Okay. Then came the teachers. Okay. So teachers followed the apostles and the prophets. And these teachers, they went about teaching, expanding, um, the uh, and preaching the gospel. Okay. So we see that persecution broke out. They went to different places. They started teaching. And then we, of course, see the work of the evangelists who were powerful uh, witnesses testifying and also drawing many people to the church or drawing many people to the body of Christ or drawing many people to Jesus Christ through mighty signs, miracles and wonders. Okay. And then we see the pastors, okay, how they were um, 
supporting the church, functioning in the church as uh, giving guidance, uh, you know, governance in the church and pastoral care. All of you with me? Yes. Okay. So this is, uh, why is it mentioned likewise in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28? Why does Paul say first apostles? Um, then why does he say that the second is prophets, teachers, miracles, and then um, uh, evangelists and then pastors. And why does he write it in this order is because of how it actually um, uh, was unfolded in the early church. And also when we look at this, uh, you, you know, this order that is given here, we need to understand it as one of governmental responsibility and authority. Okay. So governmental authority and responsibility. What is the meaning of that? Governmental authority means what? In the church, God has placed a governmental structure, right? In the body of uh, Christ, God has, been, uh, has established a governmental structure. In the home, God has established a governmental structure. In our society, God has established a governmental structure. In the workplace, there is also a governmental structure okay so in the home who is the head yes even though the uh, for god there is no jew nor greek male nor female all are one in christ jesus yes we are all in all are one but who's the head of the home who's the head of the home? family the father the husband right who's the head in the in, in the church yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> you know, the body of Christ, yes, Jesus, but in our church, in our local churches, it's the pastor. Okay, so we have a governmental structure and order that God has established in the family, in the church, in our society, <clears throat> in the office. There is a governmental structure, which means that all of us have to, you know, relate to that governmental structure or authority that God has. Uh, uh, has placed. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel Deepu, for answering those questions, right? Yes. So we see that, you know, based on the governmental responsibility and the authority, this is the order that Christ, that God has established in the church. All of you able to understand? Yes. Or all of you are. Um... Okay. So we'll um, move on. Um, so for each of these gifts that God has given us, whether we are called into membership gifts or whether we're called into fivefold offices, there is an anointing that goes with each ministry gift. Okay. So there is an anointing that accompanies each ministry gift. What is anointing? Power and? Power and presence of God. Very good. Asapu is wide awake and Lucy as well. Thank you. So anointing basically <laughs> refers to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So anointing refers to the special empowerment, the divine enablement given by the Holy Spirit to carry out a specific ministry or task. I'll repeat that again. Anointing basically refers to special empowerment or a divine enablement given by the Holy Spirit to carry out a specific ministry or a task. So it's basically your spiritual equipping that enables a person to fulfill their God-given calling effectively. Now, why is anointing important? Why is anointing important? Yes, without that, you're depending on your flesh, your human strength, your, your human wisdom, which is very, very limited, which is very, very insufficient, will not be able to help you to achieve the call and the purpose that God has for you. But anointing brings the power of God into ministry that ensures that you not only accomplish his purpose, but the, it allows you to minister beyond your capabilities, your abilities, and it helps you to bring about a spiritual or a supernatural impact, right? Um, uh, one, yes. one closing question. God will work through the anointing, yes. Our strength is not enough to fulfill God's purpose, yes. 
So it allows us to minister beyond our natural abilities and bring supernatural impact. Yes. Just one closing question. So do anointing um, varies from uh, a pastor to a pastor? Yes. Or is it the other side where, you know, it depends on the recipient of how much I have uh, uh, drawn more closer or surrendered or been more... Uh, 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 submissive intimate and submissive, submissive yes it all depends on all anointing comes from heaven correct but you can also grow in your anointing how do you grow in anointing that's why we see different anointings that are there there are different anointings to enable you to fulfill various gifts but the measure of the anointing can be greater the level of intimacy that you are with so uh, that is solely dependent on us as recipients because for everybody, the anointing is same, or is it like uh, some are anointed uh, on a different level? Each of us are given that anointing, but we need to also grow in that anointing. Yes, we're given the anointing, but we need to grow in the anointing. That's why you see you know, some pastors, the anointing is so much greater than some. It's why it's not because God is uh, partial, He's given some more, some less. No, it's because they're growing in the anointing. Like I said last week, the more you grow in your gifting, in your calling, the more that you are using and learning and in equipping yourself, the more you will grow in your anointing. The more you are intimate with the Holy Spirit and with God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the more powerful the anointing will be. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Any questions, online students? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you very much. I'll see you to this continuation of this class on Friday. Okay, thank you.